<clears throat> All right. Today's presenters are Dr. Jennifer Fabi and Julie Tada Dr. Julie Tadaro. Um, Dr. Fabi began her tenure as the Dean of the University Library at California State University, San Marcos, in August 2014. Her emphasis on engaged strategic planning has focused the library on educational partnerships, benefiting students and special collections, preserving the history of the community. She's a national leader and scholar in information literacy and has worked with the WASC Senior College and the University Commission to design experiences to embed and assess information literacy and critical thinking in student learning. <clears throat> Dr. Julie Todaro is the Dean of Austin Community College Library Services. As dean, she manages 11 campus libraries, two of which are currently under renovation, technical services and automation, as well as eight open access computer centers. Her expertise includes management and leadership with a focus on communication, change, assessment and accountability, emergency management and partnerships and collaborations. Her publications include numerous articles and columns, as well as monographs on emergency management, library management and mentorship. Her 2021 work focuses on remote leadership and management and decision making and recovery in catastrophic times. Tadaro was the 2016-17 president of the American Library Association and the 2007-2008 president of the Association of College and Research Libraries. All right, that is enough out of me. It is absolutely my pleasure um, to turn the floor over to Dr. Fabi at this point. Thank you, Mark, um, and thank you to ACRL and Choice and Taylor and Francis and also to Julie for being um, such an awesome partner in putting this presentation together. So I would like to start out just with a little bit of context about where I am coming from. Julie and I are leading within different contexts and circumstances with some very similar challenges that many of us are facing across the nation as library leaders. So um, CSU San Marcos is just a baby, a young 30 years, and the third youngest campus in the 23 campus California State University system. We are a large, primarily non-residential master's comprehensive university. The physical library is 15 years old and the building is quite modern and beautiful. And like many of you, um, people are really mourning that loss of the physical library as the way to improve our campus community. So, um, sorry about that. I got distracted by typing. Um, like most of you, uh, by about March 8th, conversations about moving to virtual instruction were well underway. And on March 11th, the decision was made on our campus to begin virtual instruction, and that that would begin on March 20th. With some parts of the physical campus, the library included, remaining operational at a reduced capacity. However, things moved quickly, as we all know, and by March 16th, as federal, state, and county guidance evolved, we were shutting down the vast majority of the campus, including the library. So although the majority of CSU campuses were already moving to virtual instruction at that time, the decisions to keep libraries operational on campuses were varied across the 23 campuses. CSU San Marcos was the first library to be able to physically close and focus our energies on robust, ro sorry, robust virtual services and I am beyond grateful to my associate dean, Char Booth, and our campus administration, the provost and president, for seeing the wisdom in that decision. Employee well-being has been top of mind in every step we have taken at the CSU San Marcos Library. And I think it is very worth pointing out that our librarians have faculty status and that all employees except administrators are represented by a strong union system. So fast forward to May, the chancellor of our system announced that all campuses would remain virtual during the fall 2021 semester. And I believe, you know, one of the very first announcements of that kind, especially to remain virtual. Um, this meant that there would be very, very few exceptions made for courses on campus relying on in-person pedagogy. So a few campuses, a few courses in the health sciences, the lab sciences and the arts. 
This has resulted at this moment in about 8% of the regular fall schedule at CSU San Marcos to be planned for on campus this fall in um, socially distant ways. Um, our library, though, will remain virtual for the vast majority of services. And at current count, nine of the 23 CSU libraries have plans uh, for some very, very reduced open hours, leaving the majority of us 14 libraries as all virtual. But as we know, things continue to change, even with just less than a month to the beginning of the fall semester. In this environment, I'm not sure that any of us really have stopped to think about a definition of success, let alone a shared definition of what success means. Certainly our benchmark statistics between 2018-19 and 2019-20 do not even compare to one another. There's just no way to tell that story. Success for me in this context includes the ability for us to provide learning opportunities, information and services in an alternative manner to in-person and to be able to think on our feet when the next challenge arises because we have no indication that these are slowing down. Um, so the rest of this presentation on, for me will be sort of the answer to this question, how are we able to pivot to the new all virtual environment and what has helped us to do that? I reflect on this because um, these types of relationships and partnerships that made things easier during our transition, and all of you have some similar factors at, at your places, have been really important in thinking about what will help us to be successful in the future. So for us, these are strong relationships with faculty and just a few really meaningful examples for us are the relationships that we have in embedded information literacy instruction, a robust course reserves program, and that our library is leading the initiative for the adoption of low or no cost course materials on our campus. Partnerships with campus IT, and that we had already begun focusing on what our critical functions were prior to the pandemic with, uh, you know, just within the, the month right before the pandemic started um, and while updating our business continuity plan. So that was helpful to have these things fresh on our minds. Um, an example of this is that we have this very robust course reserves program for electron electronic articles, chapters, and streaming media. Last year, we supported upwards of 800 course sections with a course readings list that is integrated into our learning management system. I truly believe that without already having spent two years developing a new platform, working on faculty adoption and partnership with our IT colleagues, that we would not have been in the position that we were to pivot to all virtual. So what did we do and what will we continue to do? This pandemic is not ending anytime soon. No university that library that I know of is going back to its normal in the fall. Um, a very small percentage of our budget uh, is spent on print materials anyway at CSU San Marcos, uh, about three to 5% of that whole collections budget. And in March, when we pivoted to all virtual, you know, that went away. Everything went to digital. We were no longer even purchasing physical because our campus were, was not even receiving materials. With our formal interlibrary loan programs down, we shifted our interlibrary loan queue for direct patron requests and put a team together in the library to identify digital access that was already available and that we would buy if necessary. Because we were in the middle of the semester and we have a, like I said, this robust physical textbook reserve program, we sent a staff member home with boxes of textbooks and a scanner for chapters to be placed within password protected, protected course reserves lists or sent to students who needed the information. And everybody may be gasping right now, like this is what, what about copyright? Um, you know, at that time, we were truly, truly treating this as the emergency situation that it was, thinking that we would be back online in just a few short weeks and that we would do what it took to get our students through this. 
With all of this, though, um, we were still looking at about 27% of requests that we were getting through the library not able to be filled digitally. For any materials to support courses, we are putting even more funds into purchasing multiple or unlimited licensed ebooks for those that we were able to purchase. And again, you know, links to these items were placed within a course readings list that is part of our learning management system template. This has always been a part of our goal to reduce or eliminate student cost of learning materials, but we're ramping this up big time. Now that some of the emergency provisions from publishers have gone away, we know that the, and we know that the emergency provisions from textbook platforms like Red Shelf and Vital Source, if you or your libraries were relying on these um, earlier in you know, the year, they're not coming back. We are really having to, to work swiftly, think creatively to get our acts together as this moves from an emergency situation to what is our new normal. We are investigating controlled digital lending um, to possibly have this ready for the fall, which is coming around the bend very quickly. This would allow us to lend one digital copy of any physical book in our possession, whether we scan it or we can identify it in digital form. We are working to implement this even as our plan is being reviewed by the system-wide legal counsel. We are also attempting to work with our bookstore and the big traditional textbook publishers, but as you may imagine, this conversation is slow going, even though our proposal includes one book, one patron. Our head of collections delivery and access, Lauren Magnuson, and I need to name these names because these people are working just tirelessly. Um, she has been amazing in exploring every possible way to legally get digital materials to our campus community. Early on in April, we did enter into a relationship with OverDrive, which is very popular in the public library domain. Not a lot of academic libraries have done this yet. Um, but in addition to providing access to high interest digital materials that our users were requesting, it is also the platform that we will use to deliver materials for controlled digital lending if we are in fact able to move forward. Having a platform for delivery can be or complicated or costly and working with OverDrive is opening up a, an elegant solution for us. As we work to bring back our CSU system-wide interlibrary loan and our participation in other ILL networks, on August 1st, with very minimal staffing in our building, we will be installing a set of contactless pickup lockers outside of one of the library's main entrances. Between all this and mailing directly to patrons, we hope to be able to meet 100% of needs this academic year, all with a digital first principle in mind. Due to expected and publicly communicated budget cuts to higher education in the state of California, the CSU system has been able to band together. Um, we do a lot of our negotiations together, um, and we have published an open statement to vendors that we're starting negotiations with uh, vendors at a 10% decrease to pricing this year. Um, this has, has resulted in some vendor discounts for the 2021 academic year. Like probably every academic library on the planet, we spent about 12 hours in mid-March creating an all-virtual web page in an effort to provide a one-stop shop for everything a faculty member or student might need in a completely virtual environment. And we have since spent time refining and marketing this resource. Librarians at CSUSM took the summer to transition library research guides to a new platform and to create digital learning objects to support information literacy instruction for specific courses that will now be taught in an asynchronous manner in the fall. Um, we also took the time to transition all of our uh, assessments of those services to one template so that we were all working lockstep on our assessment moving forward. A big change for us was implementing collaborative reference, which will allow us to provide reference services by chat 24 hours a day, as well as to implement pro a proactive chat widget to several web pages within our library website. And this will pop up after 10 seconds on, uh, of a user sitting on the page. 
We are piloting this now and it's already resulting in some fantastic data to use in targeting information to push out to specific groups of students and faculty and changes to make to our website based on user feedback. And um, in addition to the collaborative reference service that is 24 hours a day, we're attempting to keep staff in the fall as close to the fall schedule that they would normally have. Um, we were operating during the regular semesters five days a week, 24 hours a day with weekend hours as well. Um, there have been some wonderful silver linings of having our staff on a daytime schedule this summer, so we are not going completely back to overnight, but we will be close. Finally, I would be remiss not to mention the leadership our library is, taken, uh, is taking on campus discussions on anti-racism. Uh, from two of our librarians, Lalitha Nataraj and Holly Hampton, creating a robust Black Lives Matter library guide that serves now as the resource clearinghouse for our campus community, to taking time to learn and have challenging discussions together. We are making good use of this summer time to building out a sustainable structure in the library to keep listening, learning, and acting in the area of anti-Black racism on our campus and beyond. So what is and will remain challenging? Um, this is not just the virus any longer. Um, although this horrible virus has begun to affect, has affected my family, our employees' families on a personal level, but this is also the economic effects of the virus. Um, there have been worries about layoffs and furloughs, and we know that our library will take a budget cut, although we do not yet know what that exact amount is as of yet. Um, we are adding much more visible social unrest and upheaval to these challenges, and this has made it very important for people to take care of themselves. We have employees on leave right now as well. Um, it's been really important for me as a leader to make the case that just because we are not physically open does not mean that we are overstaffed. In the fall, we will have about eight staff and administrators on site at various times of the week for various tasks, mostly related to the delivery of physical materials. And this is all in a voluntary uh, manner. We are hiring only students who can work virtually. That is um, a, a rule for our campus right now. So this means that we are not hiring 40 students, um, almost 20 full-time employee equivalent uh, student employees this year, at least for the fall semester. And I think that, you know, we can all agree that even if you're coming back a little bit in person, if you are uh, remaining virtual with some, some uh, with virtual services, that we're all having to redesign workflows that have been with us for years and years and decades. And, and, and it is a lot um, to think about at this moment. And I will just leave you um, with something that I realized a couple weeks into this pandemic and that I have shared often with our library leadership team, and that is that we need to be bold um, to speak up, to tell people what we need and what we can do, because no one is coming to do that for us. Um, and so that has been, you know, a big goal of ours is for me to make sure that I am communicating to our campus leadership where I need to be, what the library needs to be involved in, and that our leadership team is doing that for the different departments, divisions, and services in our library. So at this point, I believe I'm handing it over to Julie. Thank you, Jennifer. This is a good example of how leadership works in that when faced with the same content and goals, we took different directions uh, to get to the same good place in terms of working with people on how we're working. A little bit of information, uh, I have 40,000 uh, seats filled, about 27,000 students, 11 libraries, two of which are currently being renovated. One is a historic building that was built in the early 1800s, that's fun. And uh, we're spread over eight counties. I have maybe 170 staff, 38 of whom are librarians, and they are faculty librarians, same level as well. So uh, Jennifer is correct. We have many similarities, but we also have lots of differences. While we are one library system, it, we can approach a great deal of what we do by campus. 
because of the culture, the organizational culture that we have. So although there we are, I think, in my opinion, the the best service across the college uh, who has a standardized approach to everything and accreditation uh, successes bore that out, we approach things with single solutions, but with individual nuance and with some individual context. I took home 170 staff in a week, and part of that was because we had so many things in place given our distance. We've been doing 24-7 reference for about 10 years, and um, we have a variety of, of environments, uh, one of which will be enhanced. So. The way I like to think about things is the top of a pool table. So forgive me if you've heard my analogy before. We have the same uh, sets of pool balls around. We're expanding some. We're uh, setting some aside right now. But basically what we're doing, and uh, Jennifer uh, supported this as well, we are racking them up in different ways. And frankly, I thought we were going to be able to do this uh, once, but quickly we saw that we had to do these things repeatedly. Uh, something would be in place and then something would change, and we are nowhere near the end of that change. So uh, I know you all are experiencing the same kinds of things. So I will share with you a little bit about what we're doing, but specifically what I did was take a step back and decide to explain to you how I approached this from a leadership perspective. and. The first of which uh, was the approach to basic categories. And forgive me if you are already doing all of these things. If so, you can use this as a checklist for how you are moving forward. Uh, but basically what we're doing is taking a look at three dramatically different things today. We're taking a look at communication, assessment, and time or timing. And those are the three critical things that I'm doing uh, and my leaders are doing and my managers uh, also leaders are doing as well. So the first thing I'm going to do for you is take each one of these separately, communication. And we have basically 12 issues in communication. One is a startlingly different approach to remote communication leadership techniques, which are different from in-person or single building communication. Luckily, we had some experience with this, as I'm sure Jennifer did, because of the, uh, the range of what we're dealing with and for us, the distance between or among campuses. So the remote communication leadership techniques were a nuance that you have to think about. The second is honesty. And that really goes forward with a great deal more than what you are telling people. Uh, clearly, transparency fits in there, but we need to be honest to not only about what we're communicating, but what we know and don't know, what we can and can't do, and what we can control and what we have no control over. And these are things that are sliding scale for all of us as we move forward in terms of how change is happening. The audience identification for us was a huge issue for things, um, and I'll talk in a minute, but basically we rebranded ourselves that first week with posters and uh, a tagline, and uh, even though you can't see us, we're still here, and so you need to go to our website and take a look at our invisible person poster. Uh, for us, that was necessary to do because there was a great deal of lack of awareness about what is happening on the ground, what's happening in person. So that seemed to help out a great deal with the single tagline. So we are looking at the variety of audiences, and in my 40,000 seats filled and in my 27,000 students, about 6,500 of them are early college high school. So I'm not only tracking the community, I'm tracking what 12 school districts are doing. And that's a lot of fun because very little of that is public given the state and funding being jeopardized for hybrid decisions and non-return uh, uh, or return decisions. So we are looking at audiences differently. The fourth thing for us was terminology for direct distribution of information. People began to take a close look at how they were designing and deciding things. For example, for a period of time, 
Social distancing was not the phrase they wanted to use, but we began to kind of track, much like a serials approach, serials changes, the terminology and how it was used so that we could piggyback on the college's terminology and then the terminology that was we were trying to crosswalk among the different documents. So we had a document from the state. We have a document from CDC. We have the documents from FEMA. We have the documents from uh, the Texas Coordinating Board for Higher Education. And then ultimately we'll have the college's plan. I also have some other plans that I'm holding on to that are extraordinarily good. Um, this tracking and this terminology is really helping us decide what to use, how to define and make sure that when we piggyback on the president's messages or student affairs messages for other support, we are communicating the same thing. With these students, you only have one shot. And with the dynamic web, they need to see a thread. They need to see a common thread. We also needed internal terminology for interpreting information. So, for example, when our IT department puts out a newsletter, we often need to interpret that for ourselves. What does that mean for us? And I got a number of interesting emails from staff saying, we just got this email. What does this mean for us? And that seems odd, but it's absolutely on target for what we need to do. Number six was obviously the branding, and we felt it critical to do that. Uh, I think it's one of the most important things you can do. You don't have to rebrand. You just have to repeat your brand so that people can identify what you are and what role you play in success. Standards and guidelines for what we do goes without saying, adopting technical writing, both in language and instructional design for what we did that was standardized across messages and across platforms for us. The data visuals and information of a paradigm shift, how things were then, how they are now, the very best context for disparate groups. And then the very first week I took the data we had and that we were building and we started to put together infographics. My assessment team did some great infographics because we could supplement our brand and our message internally with infographics. And the newest one we have coming out is what does a librarian do all day? And clearly uh, you have less of a need to do that in an on-campus classroom situation and more of a need to do that now. We need to know the specificity of what the audience is hearing for processes and products that we have. We have a variety of types of software and we've had a couple of companies come to us and ask us to beta test some software now, which we are doing, we have time to do it. We, we need to convey context with scripts because I have a 24 seven phone answer and we may have a question that has appeared with different answers. So we are trying to standardize our content with scripts. And then finally, we needed to see if we needed an alternative aggregation of information that we were going to be using uh, as we move through our fact book, as we move through our monthly uh, uh, printouts, as we move through everything, we need to be able to show people old numbers that work and old numbers that do work. So our uh, information literacy sessions were expanded to consultative service sessions, which was very helpful. Uh, in addition to that, we uh, take a very close look at the kinds of content that we're putting forward for the resources, making very clear to people we designed these and continue to design them. So our award-winning tutorials, award from ACRL years ago, uh, are seeing a 47% increase in use, and that's a piece of data that is clearly critical for us to have. The second area I want to talk about is, uh, Trying to go to two, and we now have an interesting. Uh, did you give me the presenter? Because I need to move to slide two. Whoever has, whoever can present, please move to slide two. Thank you. Assessment is our major second category, and I've already mentioned you some of those uh, areas mentioned to you because of the way that we're using terminology and assessment. It's very critical for you that you decide if you wanna pick all or some of these and keep that message clear. So are you talking benefits, value, worth, or impact? Those are literally four different things. 
in assessment of services and resources. In addition, libraries are still struggling with addressing intangible, and now we are more intangible than ever before, so it's critical that you visualize or put a context for intangible. And then, as I always talk, uh, you need to put your people and your expertise first. So when we talk about those, those uh, resources that went up 47%, they need to know that we designed those, we delivered those, and they are mapped against student learning outcomes in the classroom. So our, our, uh, the data software that we use to track our reference interactions are based on student learning outcomes. I can literally tell you the last five years of student learning outcomes that were met over the reference desk. We are now expanding that to our um, consulting, and obviously it's been there with our student IL presentations. Remote assessment is very different. We know that our vendors aggregate monthly. I need data more quickly than that, so I had to pick out content. I, that the vendors really need to, to see whether or not they can assist us in providing assessment that may be more of a, a dashboard driven where I can get content more quickly in certain areas. I'd be glad to sign up for that with someone so that I'm not waiting 30 days uh, in a three-month pandemic to be able to tell people how our data are being used. We need to firm up the terminology for data interpretation. That's critical for us. And of course, we need to look at the outreach that we are doing in terms of our branding. Is it new? Is it the moment? What is it that's working for us? We also need to do, and I used the word crosswalks before, bridges or crosswalks between the old things that we collected data on, the old types of assessment, and then move those to the new types of assessment. There are more similarities than differences. We just need to make sure, and luckily, because we have all the student learning outcome data and have for many years, that's been met uh, very successfully because there's no reinterpretation you need to do of that. We did, however, uh, expand our significant, as Jennifer was talking about, our significant approach to uh, helping people go online. So it was actually not my first terminology, but we totally pivoted to moving courses online, and that is now an advertising aspect of ours that we use. No surprise there, I'm sure many of you are using that. And then, of course, the uh, major challenge for us has been moving science online. So I, I have no vested interest in anything other than a good product, but I'm very grateful, for example, to Taylor and Francis, because we have significant uh, online e-resources of their science materials and continue to move from those. We also have uh, spreadsheets and libguides that identify those databases we have hundreds, and how those databases provide different levels of online activities for active learning for faculty. And we try to map that against pedagogy because we are a community college with incredibly diverse pedagogy. And Tesla is coming to Austin, and we'll be working with Tesla on taking a look at the different levels and types of things that we provide. So we'll be looking at manufacturing aspects we already have with many companies, and then how to move that forward with student learning outcomes. We have expanded assessment for our visual representations of data. I mentioned the infographics, different pages on LibGuides, links to things, and we are taking our Blackboard internal uh, content and changing it into the digital library, and we will be branding that more as a library in and of itself with its own staff so that I can provide my variety of staff with a variety of times for them to give people reference. We are really trying to match data to the audience because our administrators read something different than our classroom faculty might or that our adjunct faculty member might. So we're being very careful in terms of data with audiences. And then we are making sure that our definitions of user success are clear and that we uh, continue those and make any changes that we need to change in those and being very proactive in talking about our role in that success. We did that is what uh, our, our big push is in terms of our numbers. Four, 
if I can do this, I can. It's time or timing. And uh, obviously, these are not disparate or mutually exclusive concepts here, but just taking a look at timing. The thing that has, I think, uh, many administrators are struggling with more than anything else is immediacy. That was surprising to me, frankly, uh, not in terms of the library field. We've certainly turned the corner on immediacy 20 years ago. But I do find that higher education has a different definition of immediacy and uh, we uh, have always adopted a standardized uh, subject heading process for getting work done, and we keep all those on the wiki ASAP by close of business today. By the 24th, we are now uh, really ramping that up, so it's very clear to people the immediacy that we need for decision making. And clearly, the outside impact of this is, has the governor decided to do something? Has the mayor decided to do something? Because the immediacy is not under our control. So that's a huge area for uh, the area that I mentioned on before, what we can control and what we can control. Honesty and timing. Some people think they need to get it perfect before they send it out. That is not the case. You need to be upfront and say, we don't know yet. Here's what we do know. Here's what we're waiting for. Again, in that standardized context and delivered in a way that people uh, are expecting it. They don't have to search for it. And then knowing at least that people are working on something is a major aspect of this. So you don't have to get all the answers first. You will never make it through this pandemic if you want to get all the answers before you make decisions or before you send out content. Frequency, um, we discussed some things with other departments about their frequency of sending out things. Do we want to keep something static, make some things at different times? Consistency of information, you literally need the same instructional design to go forward for newsletters or email addresses, employing as much technical writing expertise as you can. Expectations are critical in terms of timing. Not everyone who works for you or works around you, and right now we're only looking at those who work for us and with us, can really meet our expectations unless we explain to them what our needs are. And that's sometimes best done in a paradigm shift. I used to be able to wait this length of time, now I can wait this length of time to get it, or vice versa. Our expectations for our users. I decided that in order to reduce conflict, which is one of the key mantras I have that I'll mention here, is that I wanted to be able to say to people that uh, what we did for them to help them while they were at home, what we did to help them as they came to school or came to use us, what we did to help them when they came to our webpage or to our locations, and what we are doing to keep them safe overall. That's the best context, and it also sets up an expectation for a student so that he or she can say, what do I need to do before I leave home if I'm going to use this service, or what do I need to do before I drive to one of their parking lots to use their, their wireless, or before I turn in my iPad and check out another. So even if you have no dates, you need to create the big picture guide so that those dates can be filled in, and then that's that entire pool table for you. You need clarity, and that comes from terminology, rationale, honesty, standardized content. I, man I mentioned the terminology, the definition, subject headings for communications, forms that you do, uh, brands on top of forms, and documentation. And then access, and how are we dealing with access in terms of speed. I mentioned we went home in a week, and we have continued to push to have some very fast turnarounds of things, again, being as honest as we absolutely could be. I have two final slides. Uh, one really talks about uh, the dramatically different issues. We have to examine the tactics of what we're doing and pivot very quickly to change those strategies. Plans are set aside for us, both operational and strategic. In fact, we were 90% down the road of one of the campuses I mentioned, and we are returning, of course, to the physical environment and plans to rethink given the next three to five years and the need to make sure our distancing is appropriate for health and safety. We absolutely, uh, as Jennifer had also mentioned, are seeing our elements and our activities is lasting longer than we thought and is also changing at a different pace 
and rake. And so some things are remaining permanent. And my next paradigm shift for staff will be exactly that. Uh, we began to collect questions the first week. We do the same thing I'm sure you all are doing, keep them in a Google document. I keep a running tally of questions. They're now 16 pages. And so we, rather than lumping them all together in what are we doing about space, what are we doing about this, I am leaving them as they are now in questions so that each staff member will trust that his or her question, no matter how it was worded, is being answered. And of course, this was disaggregated from uh, who's asked the question so that they can feel free to ask anything they want. One of the things that staff members have to realize, this is number three, is that many older support structures they relied on, both to help them with their work and to uh, create things, are now changing, and that the minimum competencies for staff and for students is going to have to change, and this drills down to job descriptions, job ads. I just hired two new librarians who finally got to start and uh, uh, circulation desk, senior library assistant, another location. And so their minimum competencies are being discussed a little differently. And so it's different with unions. I understand you may have other things. We have a very strong Senate, faculty Senate who operates. And we also have a union that we work with, but we have more freedom to insert things. But the reality is what many unions put in place, you want to ascribe to that approach anyway, in terms of providing choices and then people choose together and then we move forward on those. We also are having to redefine professional development. What must they put aside in terms of possibly a development that's a career long development and what must they get done by a certain period of time? What has to be retaken? Best example of that is Blackboard. We'd updated to collaborate a while back and although my librarians took that training, now we have to take it with a different approach in mind, and that is delivering a period of time uh, for content rather than just coming in live or, or linking or designing. So some of the standardized training had to be retaken differently and implemented immediately. We also have to realize that many of our areas of basic agreement are simply not that with our administrators and among our own staff. We are getting, as everyone is all over the country, odd pushbacks on safety and security, pushbacks on timelines, perceptions some people have, the reality of decisions. And while we need to focus on reducing conflict between or among patrons online, in person, however, and our staff, my main thing is to establish a platform. And that platform has changed. Uh, and that is what I want to finish with here in terms of uh, the perspective. In order to make these changes and examine these issues, we need to realize first we need to clarify our values. And that goes with not only the student success aspect, but with the other national things that are currently happening. What are our values? What's important to us? We have a huge EDI initiative, as Jennifer does. And uh, we are literally, even though we just assessed all of our videos with an EDI rubric that was created, we need to go back and look at it again, given the current situation. And it's critical that that's a revolving door. We need to look at our goals, we need to look at our mission and make sure that the words are right and that the vision and values are there and that our staff understand they can work anywhere they want, but these are our values. So if they work here, they espouse, follow, and uh, work with people based on that set of values. You need to pay a great deal of attention to organizational culture going forward. What was your culture? What is it now? And what will return and what should not return? We need extensive attention to timing so that when we go forward, we look at our time and you see two number threes there on purpose. Number three for me was a toss up between timing and expert communication that I mentioned before. So I made them both threes. Finally, as I mentioned, the assessment evaluated with a strong change or a focus to remote assessment that clarifies what we are and our continuing role that we play in the organization. And then finally, a very detailed drill down to each staff person, and that is our managers, 
are needing to delineate roles and responsibilities with the context. So you're a library assistant, this is what your job was, this is now how it changes. Same way with uh, our faculty librarians in terms of teaching, providing things, our information literacy council, our assessment, we all have to look at showing how people, people's daily lives will change, how the roles and responsibilities that are generic are the same. So our job descriptions don't change, but the tools with which we do our job change dramatically. And that's what we're in the midst of explaining to people, all with a strong values and vision statement. So thank you very much for listening. I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Mark and see if he has a Q&A from the chat. And it's great to um, see some familiar names on there. I hope you've got some information. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much to, to both of you, to you, Dr. Tadara, and you, to, to you, Dr. Fabi. We appreciate um, you taking the time to present, and we do have a few questions um, lined up in the queue. If you have other questions that you would like to submit, please drop those into the Q&A box. And as I said at the beginning of the presentation, we will take um, this time now to answer some of those. Um, and if we don't get to all of them, we, we apologize in advance. There are already um, quite a few. So, And I did include my email, and I believe Jennifer did too. Please feel free to email me afterwards if you'd like some more clarification. Excellent, excellent. Um, so looking through here, um, we have a question that, that came in uh, early on from Sarah, um, and Sarah asks, uh, Dr. Fabi, are you working with faculty and department deans to get recommendations for digital resources for purchase? Uh, is there digital, or, and Sarah notes, digital on demand can get expensive? So how do you keep from going over budget as you look at these items and, and purchase them? I think that's an excellent question. So going back to two of the initiatives that I talked about as being you know, so important to the success that we've had is that we had both the, the reserves program as well as what we call the affordable learning solutions program, which um, uh, it, through which we already have had these mechanisms for faculty to request materials on behalf of their courses. So we know that those materials will get used. We know that they will scale so that we'll get, you know, access that will scale to an entire group of people or at least the number of people who need to use it all at one time. Um, and so, yes, those relationships were there. Uh, then I think the, the other part of your question was that um, this can get really expensive. How are you going to pay for all of it? Um, we will have a budget cut. I do not know what that is yet. It's probably going to be somewhere between 5 and 10%. Um, and it will be a base budget cut, and that's going to be very difficult for our library to bear. Um, that being said, there are some one-time cost savings from both the spring semester and, you know, the summer and fall semesters that we'll see just by not being on site. So we have shifted and immediately shifted budget into being able to meet the information resources demands. Um, you know, I think that long term we're go we are going to have to figure out what this looks like budget-wise because, you know, there will be Im economic impacts because of um, the virus and resulting uh, economic situation. But in the short term, we're, a, we're being able to shift some one-time funding. Um, we also have been able to, and I don't know if this is something that, you know, your campuses have done, it's very campus specific, but we were just asked to put in proposals for CARES Act funding. So if something was directly related to courses, then we could ask for money to cover those costs for the fall and spring semester. So we put in uh, um, some requests for, some, for streaming media, for electronic books for course reserves, as well as for those um, contactless pickup lockers that I talked about. Um, I would like to add to that. Um, we have a very robust uh, faculty assessment program for our online databases. That's a service we do three times a year. We have now made that more of a rolling assessment. 
Uh, I asked our librarians to shift instead of departmental requests for uh, which we send out every fall uh, for ideas for things. We are now sending targeted ones to individual uh, each individual faculty member. We have several thousand and they will get emails saying this is what you teach. This is what we have for you. So that's time consuming and proven to be very helpful to us. We actually did a second form that we filled out that would allow people to uh, connect with us for the consultative services I mentioned. We also have digital, uh, you know, three click program. We typically put a sum of money in there. We don't tell people what that sum is. What we do advertise is the average cost of a title and the number of dollars that we spent last year. And then we move that along the scale. So, uh, I mentioned we were renovating a library. We had book collection money when they started. We stopped buying print and we started because our bond monies in the state do allow us to buy capital. We started to buy ebooks. But as Jennifer said, you know, you can choose a database, but I'm trying to prepay it because quickly a database subscription, digital uh, on demand doesn't, but a database subscription quickly turns into your operating budget. So going forward, uh, our operating budget uh, will need to change. And so I'm taking a look at that now. I don't think our budget will be reduced this year. I actually think it will be reduced in 21, uh, excuse me, 22. And that's, um, we are in control typically of the amount and where it comes from. And as Jennifer said, we have realized some savings as well and will continue to that we think can go to that. Thank you. Excellent, thank you both. Um, we have a question here that came in um, a little while ago and it's uh, addressed to Dr. Fabi, but I, I really would be curious to hear both of your perspectives on this. Um, and it may be a question that is perhaps uh, difficult, but I think it's something that probably a lot of people are, are dealing with. Um, and Aaron asks, how can staffing be voluntary and equitable at the same time? And Aaron says, I'm struggling with that um, themselves. And so do you have any, any ideas about that, Dr. Fabi, to start out? So I saw this question come in uh, when it came in, and I've really just been mulling this for the last <laughs> several minutes. Um, so I, have you all seen the, um, it's hard to, to, to paint this visual. Okay, so basically when it comes to staffing at this moment, I'm thinking of our, we are not, we are not providing staffing to interact with the public. So I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that. I think that if we were being, heavily encouraged by our university administration, and by that I, I mean kind of forced, right, to have the library open, we would be having a, a bit of a different conversation right now. Um, this pandemic and staying at home is affecting people differently, and the resulting economic and, um, you know, social issues that are very heavy on us right now, they are really affecting people differently. And one quick example I'll give that you know, this should paint a picture for you is, you know, I've got several direct reports who I'm having meetings with them and their babies are climbing all over them, you know, during these meetings. This is not something that we're not at all experiencing. Uh, I'm lucky, I mean, not lucky that I have my teenagers, <laughs> I've got teenagers, but, you know, I'm seeing this and not everyone's being affected differently. So to me, what this means is, you know, if my outcome for every individual employee is to be able to work through this pandemic and I need to know what does okay mean for you in doing this, then I can say, and of course it's not just me, it's a whole network of leaders in my library, I can say these are the five things we need done. Who is able to do these things? Now I've got other people that are being affected in different ways and they're just going crazy staying at home. And they really would love to go socially distance into the library two hours a week. And so far it's working out beautifully. I'm sure we'll, that we will get into some conflict, but to me, everybody getting to be okay, as long as we can help support that is what equity looks like in this circumstance. The, 
the first two weeks, we sent out an email to uh, a large number of our hourly staff. Uh, the college paid people for several weeks uh, when they were home with no responsibilities in the college. Mine had responsibilities. But we also had computer center staff where we had people and very few responsibilities would happen. So we did a, a training program they could do, uh, you know, uh, kind of positioned in that way. And one of the things that we found is exactly what Jennifer said, is that people said, nope, I want to come in. And we had a very strong standard, which was, you're going to wear this much PPE, you're not going to be in this space for this much time. Even if you don't think you wear gloves, we are going to require that you wear gloves. In some cases, we had a, a discussion with the administration, and it dealt with opening a space that uh, theoretically could have sat many people, but socially distanced was not. When I found that the standards were not going to meet ours, I offered the space, but no staff. And I said, uh, I can't ask my staff to go back in if we don't take this step rather than that step. And they went, okay, and ended up even not opening the space. Uh, but I was very honest with them about that. What I've done, however, is ask human resources to come up with a rubric for app applying for alternate work locations, and we will get that, and we will actually put that into play more than likely probably the second week of August. And that form, you would go fill it out, and you would say, just as Jennifer said, here are five things I'm going to do. These are, I'm going to work 40 some odd hours a week. This is how I'll do it, et cetera. And then we will pull all those forms together. HR will choose, much like they choose for FEMLA approval. Uh, HR will choose that each one is in line, and then we will move forward with that balance and equity. And I think that will help guarantee some of what Jennifer said, which is so important, and that is that everyone feels they've been heard, they've had a chance to do things. At some point, people who feel are so scared, we actually talked about having EAP on standby to help people. That's our employee assistance program, obviously, uh, and that we would have some of our staff who said, I can never come back. And we would say, well, let's talk to EAP. The job I have for you is this job. Uh, I will tell you that's why I'm implementing the digital library so that we can, in fact, uh, coordinate with some people who are vulnerable, who may, in fact, not be able to come back at the same time some people are. And then we'll go from there. Uh, it's different when you talk to people from different states, as Texas is sitting in the middle of a problem due to our own making, frankly. Um, and, you know, I, um, I'm i not going to put my employees at risk because of something that uh, other people did as much as I possibly can. So the HR process, which is cleared through our attorney, is a helpful one because it gives us a rubric. Uh, we also are, we have floor plans for every library now and how they each need to use PPE, and then those have already been submitted for CARES money so that all of the PPE appears for that. I've been hoarding uh, gloves and masks and things, frankly, since February 7th. So my staff have them in their trunks of their car. So when we open again, we'll bring them all back. We'll get the band back together again. But we'll also ask for CARES money for uh, as much as we can do purchase because, of course, CARES money is one time, and then see if we can pay things forward and make it very clear to staff where our um, economies are and how long things last for um, digital virtual content. All right. Well, thank you both so much um, for taking the time to present today. Looking at the clock, we are at the top of the hour. Um, so uh, again, thank you for these really wonderful presentations. We have got lots of indicators in the chat and the Q&A that those of you listening in out there thought, thought this was valuable and well worth your time. So I'm just letting you know how much uh, folks are appreciating that. Um, I would just remind folks that we did record today's session, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice with a link to that recording. 
And if you have just another minute or two, um, you should see in your chat box a link to a survey to uh, respond to the session. Please take a few moments and give us a few uh, responses to that. We use them to try and improve the sessions. Um, and thank you uh, to all of you out there listening in today. We appreciate your time and we hope to see you in the near future at other sessions. Thank you all so much. Thanks to Taylor and Francis as well for giving us this forum.